this is Riding With Re. Welcome back to my channel or welcome if you are new here. Today is a very exciting video. We are going to visit Louise Robson, otherwise known as Thoroughbred Dressage. She specializes in retraining of X racehorses and dressage. And so we're gonna go and see her and she's gonna show us four horses, four horses, all at different stages of their retraining from really just having come off the track all the way up to working just below Grand Prix. It is super exciting and I can't wait to share it with you. This video is brought to you by the Thoroughbred Census. If you own an X racehorse and you're in the UK, you have until 31st of December to get your horse signed up for the Thoroughbred Census via the Retraining of Racehorses organization. There is more information in the description. It is the first time that we've ever done this in the UK and it is super exciting. So stay tuned for more detail on that as we move through the video. Video. Let's go and see Louise. So I've just arrived with Louise, who's going to give us a little tour and then we'll see some of the horses in action. Here at Thoroughbred Dressage, we have a full range of kind of how to access an X race horse, if you want to call it that. So we have some that are from owners that have bred them and kept them all the way through their lives and they've come here for training and competing. We have some that when they've left racing, they've been bought by owners and they've arrived here for training at different levels along their journey. Some at the very beginning, some for kind of training concerns, whether it's like they can't do trot canter very well or the rider doesn't feel safe when cantering. So that's another avenue of kind of private purchase, either from the trainer or from someone that has bought them out of racing and then you've purchased from them. We also have varying horses here from different rehoming schemes. So like the Godolphin Lifetime Aftercare Programme is a really good one. There's also places like Heroes Charity and the BTRC as well. We also have horses here that have come direct from the trainer. So we've got a full range of how you can access these horses. And it doesn't always need to be direct from a trainer. It doesn't need to be from a retrainer. But the main thing is at the heart of it is that these horses are always loved whoever owns them or however they are here or whoever finds them they're still loved and people are trying to find the best way to do the right thing by them i wonder if greg's awake we can start greg greg you're gonna come and say hi because now we're going to be hi oh hi. so greg is from godolphin rehoming oh. he is um he recently just won the roi national championships medium level oh. he won well, not about ninety-five thousand, ninety-three, ninety-five thousand on the track he was a flat rate flat racer and yeah, he's working at medium level at the minute. He just always looks exhausted when he comes in. <laughs> night party. And then uh, we've got mixtures. We want a mixture of warm blood, dressage horses, blue training, and free sources. So, for many of the dogs, it's like my pride and joy. She's like the main asset of the yard. So, she has her tent. Um, so, we have horses like Ozzy. Ozzy's actually a really good one because he never actually raced. He um, dumped quite a few uh, work riders down in Melbourne um, and <laughs> he kind of basically wouldn't work kind of properly without trying to deck jockeys. Oh, wow. So um, so he never actually made it up to a racetrack. But he is in for, in theory, retraining, but training to see what he wants to do with his owner. His owner is like really lovely. Um, and so he's been here since July, August. We then have para horses, so part of the job is para ponies as well, so we have international para horses, so Shrek's Fantastic. travelled the world, Ms Pearl, she is an international para horse, Kevin, warm blood, he has won me regional dressage titles, he's won me national dressage championship too, he has been a, he was long listed for Tokyo as a para horse, wow, so basically this is mainly warm blood out here, okay. apart from Ozzy um. and uh, Greg, um, this is Flubber, she is also uh, Dana, she is also a para horse as well. She's just currently having her snacks. Most of the horses, well, all the horses at the minute are out overnight in during the day. Um, we've got, we're very fortunate, we've got about 40 acres down there for them. It's really, really lovely. So they can be out all the time, like overnight. And they come during the day, because they're happy. Lovely. And then, obviously, we switch around when the weather turns. Um, but that's why they're all half asleep, muddy, content. Um, and then we've got the barn where we've got. This side again, we've still got a bit of a mixture. So we've got Pip, who's called Tower of Allen. He's the next race horse. He finished racing when he was 11. Um, he came in for training. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> <laughs> and he's basically in for poor performance. Um, and he's now going really, really well. And his owner's very, very, very happy with him. So when you say him. poor performance, is that after racing and owners having trouble or during racing? So he was after racing. Mm -hmm. So his owner was always struggling a bit with his spookiness and his 
like, if you want to call it rideability, it wasn't that he was unrideable. It was just that when he was being ridden, he was spooky and it made those riders quite nervous, which mm. is quite really common. Um, and especially when you're on your own and in livery art, which is really difficult. Yeah. So he came here, she went on holiday and she said, look, can you have him for two weeks training? And then that, like, literally within the first couple of days of me riding, I realised he couldn't turn very easily and he would jump up and down. And he never threw me off, but he was just saying he couldn't do it. So it kind of then turned into what you might call poor performance. As, and there's something going on with this horse. He's not being mean, but he's something's wrong. Something's yeah. not right. And so we went kind of to, we went, well, went my vets and my farriers and physios. And we found what was wrong with him. And basically, he's now going amazingly. Really happy, not spooky. Rider's really confident with him. So he's staying for a bit longer because actually it works out really well for his owner. But yeah. she's got the support as well. Um, so yeah, so Pips, they all become part of the family here. which is like Evidently. <laughs> This is Tim. <laughs> Tim. <laughs> Tim is four and he is a warm blood and he is absolutely wonderful and you will lose hours of your day with Tim. So Tim and then Phoebe, they are from the same stud. Uh, Phoebe's competing medium advanced, medium level. She is a warm blood as well. Princess Cass, uh, better known as Philip, owned by the King, bred by Queen Elizabeth II. Wow. He's training advanced level dressage. I know he looks again, so this little thing. He looks a bit draggled in the stable sometimes. Um, but so he's an interesting one of he's quite sharp in the head and quite quick um, in the head, which you can get with x ray sources. So he doesn't do a lot of competing because he's more content at home. So it's that mental side of things. Does that make sense? So yes. Like, he's happier and more content being at home and actually has competing a bit of potentially fry him a bit more. Yes. Um, so he will come out when he's Hello. more established at the advanced level because he actually finds comfort in the more advanced work. Um, so yeah, that's Philip. And owned by the king, you said. Owned How does that king. work? He paraded in. Queen's 90th birthday celebrations alongside Quadrille. Wow. Um, so he's pretty cool. Sky, she's a training livery. And then Corny here is kind of fresh out of racing. Corn. So he is actually doing the very first stage of the training of getting on and getting him sorted. Basically all of the kind of very, very early stages of getting on, feeling safe, going around. Hi. <laughs> um, and he's owned by a really lovely lady, so he's in for a couple of weeks schooling. And then the other side, we then have Tilda, here again, training delivery, but she's not an x-ray source. <laughs> the rest of these guys are x-ray sources. So we have Bailey here, he's called actually Bailey's Accelerate. He's from Amy Murphy Racing. Hello. Uh, he picked him straight up from Amy last year. He retired due to a tendon injury, so he started history training. Started this year after having a recovery from everything. Rock on Westy. Well, no, Westy. We almost called him Kanye at one point, but we stuck at Westy. Um, he fractured his shoulder, raced in Ireland, wow. came over, and we started retraining him. But actually, he didn't. He couldn't stand up to the ready work. It mm. then started proving too many problems. So that's why he has that rug slip because his fractured shoulder. So he's just retired now, but he's very happy. Again, they never leave. They arrive. Oh, Piglet, racing name showroom. Um, came in for retraining two years ago. Was meant to be here for six weeks. Oh, oh gosh, look at his markings! Hey, baby. Hey. Oh. <laughs> uh, Chippy, what's he called? Chip? Well, he's called Chip. But the his name is Mr. Lover. He is our oldest person. I retrained him when he was three. Oh. He's now 24. He went off to various other homes. He came back to me six years ago, well, seven years ago now, eight years ago. I brought him back to five quid, basically, in return. Oh. When he was 16. Someone found me through some means and he came home, bought him back for five pounds, and he became Quaddy's field mate and best friend. So he looks after Quad for me in the field because Quad is quite like Zebedee, he bounces and does everything. So Quadrill and William, or racing name is Fourthbridge, again, they are two of the King's horses. So these two plus Princess Trust, um, mm. bred by Queen Elizabeth II. Quad's competing at a very, very high level of dressage, and William is three years into history training. Yeah. So the first horse that we are going to take a look at is Corny, who has just left his racing career. So Louise is going to show us what she does with those horses who are super early on in their ex-racing career. Hi, Corny. Hello. Hello. My is like, it's real. Okay. It's relatable. It's so organised, disorganised chaos. The weird thing is, if you ask me to find something straight up, to be like, yeah, it's that. Exactly. I feel like that's the same with 95% of horse people. So just while you're getting him ready, talk to me a little bit about this horse and what you're going to plan to do today. So this horse, like, so his owner is what I would describe as 
described as the gold standard level of owner. Corny left racing, his last race, I believe, was May this year. I could have that wrong, but it, I know it was this year. And what happened, so we had, during National Racehorse Week, we had a discounted scoping day. Over 90% of racehorses have some sort of like ulceration, so gastric mm. ulcers. And so on our free scoping morning, his owner brought him along and we had him scoped and he had grade three slash four ulcers. So before, you know, that potential conversation of a naughty horse or a bad horse or this, that and the other, she actually gave him a full MOT before he even had his letdown time so he could recover, as it were, from racing and have his letdown time in the best way possible. Well, it's an interesting way around you talk about it because I think we, we know, I think it's common knowledge if you are thinking about x races or you know about them, that you let them have a bit of time off after racing. And then you would think that a lot of people would let them have that time off, bring them back into work and then do the MOT. Yeah. But actually the way that you've talked about letting them relax first and they yeah. can't relax if there's things going on. That's, no. you know. And there are also people are going to be like, say, you know, naturally, especially at this time of year, people are going to be looking towards how do I keep weight on my x race horse. And especially mm -hmm. if they're going for a down period of time, the likelihood is when you've got ulceration, they're not going to gain, they're not going to really gain any weight. They might actually even look worse. Mm. And so therefore, the first thing we're going to do is put more food into them, which is going to affect their temperament. Mm. So, and you've got to think of it, I would say, as conditioning safely. So it's kind of like when you see a skinny horse or something losing weight, you want to naturally put more food in because you want to help. You don't want to not help them. The problem is you're then adding more calories to a blood horse anyway that yeah. isn't necessarily in work. So where's it going to go? They're going to show more behaviours of leading them around, turning them out, you're going to have problems there and then people are going to start saying, oh, that's a difficult horse, don't go near it, you can't turn it out, you can't do this, you can't do that, they're not going to settle in the field. You know, you're not giving them the best structure and letdown for their muscles to be able to then develop in a new way. They're so fit, but that's for racing. So then you want them to be able to let down. It's like, you know, if you're training for a marathon, after you've done the marathon, you don't keep running, you have yes. to downtime afterwards. But if you've got good guts, the food is used like utilized properly, so then their foot growth is optimal, so then you've got better shoeing, so then you've got, you know, the horse is more comfortable, mm. especially when we're retraining them, we're putting the rider in a different place on their body and we're asking their body to work in a different way. So when they're, they're in theory, if they're then fighting gut issues and mental issues because they're slightly like high on calories, mm. you know, you're already kind of setting them up for failure. So he's been here now three and a half weeks spent the first two weeks doing groundwork so nothing but long reining so with long reining all racehorses when they start their training so when you back and break them um they start with long reining so all your ex racehorses will know how to long rein the only difference will be that they would have been started off in a round pen which the majority of us don't have access to so when i first get them we start long reining them one because it gives them that first career and second career kind of bridging of the gap but the most important thing is that we start developing their posture. So the reality is you're taking an upside down horse and a downhill horse to add to that. And you are trying to make them in a more uphill way, come off the forehand. Um, and that is so that they can become stronger through the back, have better posture as a riding horse. So as a riding horse, you are putting the rider in a different position to that of a racehorse. Um, as for a racehorse, the rider whether it be a work rider or a jockey is always positioned on top and above the horse um and in terms of the contact the hand sits uh, on top of the neck so roughly where the wither connects to the neck and the hands just sit on top of the neck and they kind of don't really move from there so all of the weight if you want to call it that is distributed either on top of their backs or above them so there is actually no weight on them as a riding horse we are kind of looking for riders to be on top of the horse on their backs but more around them so the distribution of weight is very different so the long reining begins to kind of one like i said develop the posture it starts teaching a racehorse how to use themselves in a different way without the rider being on top um so they can work independently so we remove ourselves from the situation which allows them to build up and develop the way in which i equate it is you've got to think of it a bit like doing a sit-up um, because it's those kind of core muscles that you're targeting so if you think as a rider, if you want to do 10 sit-ups in a row, then have a 30-second break and then 10 sit-ups again, see how long you can kind of do that for before it starts to ache a bit. And then if you equate that into a horse's scenario, they are not only having to do sit-ups, but they're having to do kind of weighted sit-ups if we're on them. So we just need to be mindful of that when we're training them. The long reining as well is also a really good place to start for when you're first starting retraining and, and first starting riding your x-race horse. It's a really good opportunity to assess how they are that day and how they're going. Um, it might also be that we kind of remove maybe a bit of freshness. 
but it can also be tightness that you see in these early stages with the x race horses and then it just gets the horses moving again without the rider on top and i always do it so that we start off the, se- the session productively so i'd rather that they have a bit of a buck and a kick um in the long reins um rather than with me on top so that the main thing is you're trying to keep the brain as relaxed as possible so they take in all the information and you're warming up the kind of correct muscles in a good way you're already beginning to have that conversation with the contact of being able to touch the rein see how your horse responds to the touching of the rein and kind of working them through their problems without you being on board it helps build their confidence helps build our confidence and it all sets you up for better sessions and then a better longevity of your relationship with your horse. So that was Corny, who was obviously at the very start of his ex-racer career. We're now going to move on to Wills, who is at Novice Elementary. So a few more steps ahead and then we'll move on to a horse who is even further ahead than him. So all ex-race horses can walk. Because they've got very good walk, they can gallop well, which also means they can canter well. I don't really touch the walk, as in I don't really mess with it because it's very easy to ruin the walk, especially in the early stages. So with most X-ray sources, they've got big over tracks, especially, you know, most of the free walk on a long range, for example, at times two. So they're really good movements to be able to pick up your bigger marks on your X-ray sources and let them walk. So when you maybe have other things such as medium trots, which aren't going to be a highlight with your X-ray source until they're about, you know, elementary medium, because you're kind of going into that more sitting, pushing way. So it kind of balance itself out so if you can do a medium trot for a six or a six and a half but you can walk for an eight and it's a times two movement i would let your x-ray sports walk normally when we are then looking towards collecting the walk you're looking for greater activity of the joint to be a good racehorse you don't want too much action through the joint and the limb so the greater the action when you put that action on hard fast ground you are running the risk of picking up more soft tissue injuries. So that's why you see quite a few X-ray sources going into showing because they're kind of straighter through their movement. It's not that they can't not bend their joints. That's why pole work's really important with them. We've got to show them how to basically pick up and put down their joint um, and place their feet. And then whenever I think towards collection, it's more like free walk on a shorter rein. So again, we're not interrupting the rhythm. And then with the canter, the canter again, like I said, it could be quite difficult. But with horses like Greg, for example, I actually learned to lengthen my reins. He was quite difficult to canter and organize. He has a massive canter. Plus, he's a big horse. Plus, he gets quite strong and he would pull down quite strongly. So as a rider, you would also like you just feel strength through the rein. So you want to kind of, in theory, get them off the rein. But they're fragile enough to the like as it is to the contact. So it's like, well, how do I have this conversation with them? So you have to teach them to balance themselves. So that's where your long reining, your pole work, that hacking, all of that comes in. But part of the ridden stuff was that actually I had to lengthen my reins to allow him to teach him how to balance himself equally on all four hooves. As soon as I started to lengthen my rein and actually still keep moving and turning him, he then balanced and came a little bit more up off the forehand and started to kind of find a way through with a lot more ease. Plus also working on the transitions, um, which again just helps establish everything, the half halt, the balance, the straightness. Um, and we have to remember that with our X race horses, we are trying to get them in the best balance possible for whatever level they are at in their training. So the kind of level of balance and how balanced they are across all four hooves on the left and the right rein varies throughout the levels, but it's our job to kind of help set them up appropriately. For example, they like to live in left flexion. So most of the race courses in this country are left hand runs. So they think being in left flexion is straight. So we have to show them where the middle is and again, that takes time because if you put them to the middle, uh, like dead in the middle, they already feel like they're in right flexion. So if you then get true right flexion, <laughs> they're feeling like they're six feet out to the right. So it's just time and slow little changes. For 29 and I find myself wondering, oh, what did happen to the last 10? Ran away with my life, fast forward, never turn back again. It's kind of funny that the more we pass time, the more we need to set the rewind. And our team was the year I had to leave you. But... Before we move on to the next horse, I wanted to hear from Louise a little bit more about the Thoroughbred Census and her work with the Retraining of Racehorses organisation. So, Louise, obviously a lot of your life's work now if we can call it that is dedicated to the retraining of racehorses and so the thoroughbred census must be something that feels quite 
special and close to your heart. So talk to me a bit about it. Well, the Thoroughbred Census is a great incentive because it allows us to, well, first of all, tell our story mm. about our x race horses, which is so wonderful. We all love the story of our own x race horse, but it also is going to improve the traceability of these guys when they leave racing. You know, it's also not just for, if you want to call it your riding horse when they leave, it's also for your broodmares, for your horses that are in point to points as well, for horses that have maybe raced and left this country. It's a really good way of improving the traceability, which will ultimately lead to better welfare for these horses post-racing. And it also means then for British Racing and for the ROR, that they can then help support riders better in the retraining so it allows them to have uh, or kind of maybe work towards more educational point of view as well it, it's about it's wholly about the thoroughbred so from the breeders the owners the trainers all the way through these horses lives it's the really biggest thing the welfare of these horses in racing they get like 10 star care and i think sometimes that's a big misconception is that racing does care people in racing care they love these horses and we love these horses post-racing, so we always want to do the best by them, whether or not we're the breeders putting them on the floor or whether we're looking after them till the end of their days. It's about the overall love of the thoroughbred. Well, hi. You take that one. I'll come back for my kiss. Um, so we are on to our third horse, who is Greg. He is the cuddliest creature um, and he's currently working at Advanced Elementary Medium. Elementary Medium. So one step up from the horse we had before and then we have one final horse to show you afterwards who is working at a very high level indeed. Getting your x race horse to work through the back is probably one of the hardest things. If you were to ever gallop a racehorse, um, there's this really cool moment when they go from canter into gallop. And when they go into the gallop, they kind of sink down to the floor and then they extend out. And where they kind of split in half is where you are sat. If you think like all horses in, like have the same amount of bones, tendons, ligaments, you know, et cetera, et cetera. How they're put together in the horsey making factory makes them the, the breed that they are. So racehorses are put together so that their kind of body allows them to have the most ground covering stride with a minimal amount of effort. So to allow for that to happen, their body needs to be able to kind of sink down and, and extend out. So what we've got to do with these guys is in a riding situation is sometimes it feels like we're sat in a bit of a bucket. Um, so their back goes, is hollow and then their neck goes up. And the kind of natural thing you'd want to do or the thing you might want to feel like you want to do is sit into them more. And actually, it's the worst thing you can do. So I kind of call it bridging the gap. Um, so or kind of using their first career to aid their second career. So in racing, when you are work riding every morning, um, they start off in the jog. Um, and all the riders are in half seat. So being a, and the half seat allows the horse to kind of slightly drop their neck to lift their back up to you. So I apply the same kind of theory and practices into the retraining. So whenever you feel the back go down, I actually remove myself out of the situation. I get up off their backs and I focus more on being able to touch the rein to slightly soften them through the base of the neck. So drop their neck to lift their back. So their back always comes up to you rather than you going and searching for their back. Tell us about the last horse we're going to see. Uh, so, my absolute love child. Uh, so, Quadril, he was ROR Elite Dressage Champion in 2019, ROR Horse of the Year 2019. He's one of the highest competing X race horses in the country and in the entire world, which is kind of daunting. Wow. Owned by the king, just to add in that fight. Casual. <laughs> what a one to end on. <laughs> he is everything. Do you find it hard with the racehorses who haven't had turnout? How do you help them transition to? So some of them, like there's the ideal is that we want them to let down and have a bit of a holiday if they've come straight from a trainer. Like, so we've got quite a few. So Bailey came straight from a trainer. Um, but we have some horses like Corny that's already done the turnout bit and has mm. already kind of got into that way of life. Some find the turnout concept struggle really, really difficult. So if you get them from a trainer and you turn them out and you see them pace in the field, it's more detrimental for them to be out there pacing mm. because they don't understand. So some, when they leave the trainer, almost need to be ridden away or worked away. So mm. it might be that you only work them a couple of times a week, even if it's just long running them somewhere, but they're mentally still in that work. Yeah. Mode, so they've done something. And then actually you find that they settle more in the field. Mm. But what we try and do is if we've got ones that really don't understand, we might turn them out in the arena together with another horse to get mm. used to being in close proximity to another horse and start off with 
five minutes and take them out before they stress. Yeah. So it's about getting them before they start panicking, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. And then when they then progress to the field, hopefully they found a friend that they've buddied up with in the arena. Um, and then trying to get them in before they get worried. So again, start off with half an hour build from there. And normally we'll do it whereby we work them and then turn them out so they're mm. a bit quieter in the brain and the body and they want to settle a bit more rather than just be like, off, off we go. go, yeah. yeah see you later. Mm. Um, but it can be a real challenge for people. It's a real challenge. And um, we do have a few that come to the worst weather in the winter. Princess Trust Philip walks to the end of the barn, sees the rain. He won't go out, he won't leave. He will categorically not leave the barn. He's like, no. And like, Quad needs to be out because he's a bit of a sprightly soul. But bad weather, he just, he's straight at the gate and he's like, princess time, get me in. And again, you would be like, well, the horses need to be out and moving as much as possible, that's fine. But also when it's to their detriment, they're just stood there. It's like actually better for them to be in and eating and calm and yeah, happy. Yeah. And you do end up, you know, that's the difficult side to it. You want the ideal, but what the horse wants, it's mm. working with them a bit more. Uh, so I think it's really important to note the timeline of these horses. The hardest bit with retraining sometimes is keeping the brain occupied whilst the body catches up, um, which can be quite difficult because in all honesty, you know, the first two, three years, you're really just teaching them walk, trot, canter, in and out line, changing the rain, transitions. Now, it might be quite daunting that I've just said years, but that's where you've got to get inventive of one never you know mine only really go in the arena twice a week under saddle the rest of the time they're in the long reins and they're out hacking and they're doing pole work so it's really difficult especially sometimes with social media especially with like you know transformational tuesdays is kind of to see someone doing it in six weeks or six months you know and you might feel like actually i'm on year four and i've barely got out of trot our journeys are our own journeys with our x race horse and we've always got to be their biggest cheerleaders and we've always got to kind of support them on their journey you know yes support others be really happy for others but try not to compare because it can end up putting additional pressures on you and your x-ray source and you're meant to love and enjoy them and really enjoy the retraining process and celebrate them for who they are and like on that kind of comparisonitis thing if we're doing a dressage kind of focus if you go to your first competition or you're competing and then you feel it's slightly, you know, let's say unfair when you see warm bloods going around, you know, the breeding with uh, warm bloods is better than ever. And the horses are amazing in the way they move. But if you keep comparing your ex-race horse to a warm blood, I don't think that's really fair on your ex-race horse, because the reality is you've got this horse that's in a second career. The body is not built to do the job you know that they are doing for you and they are trying really hard to do that job so you have to be your x-race horse's biggest cheerleader and be able to look after them and know sometimes when you might need to try a different way of approaching something you've got to love them for who they are like train the horse you have not the horse you want so when you get your x-race horse don't train them like a dressage horse look at them see how they're put together and train them and their confirmation and understand their first career to age of second career rather than kind of getting on them and say right now you'll be a dressage horse and I will ride you like this be very mindful and get as much education as you can about how they've been looked after in racing how they've been ridden different types of tack what's worked what hasn't look at racing photos to see maybe what nose bands and bits they ran in to kind of keep them as happy as possible and see how you can put that into their second career and then you'll have a fantastic relationship with your x ray source. Well, that is it from me and Louise today. I hope that you have left a feeling that you have a little more information, feeling inspired, particularly if you are an x ray source owner or soon to be x ray source owner. And a reminder that if you do currently own an x ray source, you have until the 31st of December 2023 to sign up for the Thoroughbred Census. It is the first in the UK. It's super exciting and it's incredibly important for tracking the welfare of the horse that leave racing so do sign up all of the details are in the description for you see you soon